Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, good morning. Uh, this is a distinguished assembly. I'm delighted to be here, honored to be here. Um, I thank you, Arno. Uh, 14 years. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that things have changed over those 14 years. I think I would say plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Uh, really, uh, the issues of communication in science and how that is supported uh, are age-old questions. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased that this forum is examining those. Um, I've been asked to talk about uh, the health of science, so to speak, from the uh, American perspective. Um, Funding, uh, I will talk about a little bit, uh, but that is only a part. I'll get to that later. Um, also, uh, I want to talk about how the health of science depends on the health of publishing. Um, uh, Robert Yon says it's really the other way around. The health of publishing depends on the health of science. Um, I suppose it goes both directions. Um, uh, Robert Yon is a, uh, is a gentleman and, I must say, a very pleasant and able interlocutor. Uh, I, I have enjoyed uh, discussing these issues with him. Uh, as you've heard, I come at this from a checkered background, <laughs> uh, a teacher, a scientist, um, an administrator of a national laboratory where I was assistant director of the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab for 16 years until four years ago when I stepped aside, I was an elected member uh, of the US Congress from New Jersey. Um, I want to speak about, really today, from the perspective of AAAS. I want to say quite a bit about AAAS because, um, well, I like to talk about it. I think it's a great organization. Um, but also, uh, I think it is uh, important to understand um, uh, what we do and how publishing fits into a mission-driven society. Um, I've been asked to talk about what's going on in Washington. Um, that's not only hard to explain, um, um, changing by the hour. Um, actually, the government is shut down again this morning because of snow. Not, that's the part of government that wasn't already shut down by uh, the um, argument over uh, the southern border. Um, but I will uh, try to uh, make some observations about those things and then observations about uh, open access uh, from my perspective um, uh, of, at, at this uh, society. Um, so uh, let me move quickly because that's a lot to cover. Uh, and uh, I, I, I know there are, for any part of my presentation, there are people in this room who are more expert than I. And so no doubt we can have a good uh, conversation um, either in this session or later uh, in the hallways. Um, the um, AAAS is the world's largest general science membership organization. Uh, founded in 1848 when some disciplinary scientists banded together to work on what was called then and now the advancement of science. Now the word scientist was a new word at the time. Uh, and the idea of looking after the health of science at large, as opposed to botany or geology, um, was really a new concept. Um, it has grown from that time to 120,000 members in many dozens of countries, uh, thousands of distinguished elected fellows, an annual meeting that is wide ranging and includes uh, uh, roughly 10,000 attendees, programs where we place PhD level scientists in all three branches of the US federal government, um, give awards to journalists, uh, select uh, graduate science students for a summer working in major media outlets um, and any number of other programs and many activities in education, in advocacy, in policy, diplomacy, publishing, human rights, uh, and 
law, and society. We are very active in promoting women in science, diversity uh, of all kinds in science, uh, and public engagement with science. Um, I know Robert Jan uh, had made a comment just moments ago that he wants us to rethink whether and how we can do what we have been doing. Uh, so um, I will try to set the stage for that discussion. Um, we have a grand and inspiring mission. And everything we do begins with this mission. We are a leading scientific society. I mean that in two senses of the words. We're large and influential, leading in that sense, but we also try to be standard setting. Um, we are, uh, go beyond uh, the parochial interests of individual disciplines. We represent all disciplines, anthropology, medicine, dentistry, astronomy, sociology. And we think of ourselves as the force for science. This is a, a phrase that I cooked up uh, when I came to AAAS uh, about four years ago, uh, where we are advocating for the health of science because of science's importance to human welfare. Um, challenges, um, actually, maybe more than these four, but I think this helps to set the stage. Uh, a challenge of engaging the public and building appreciation for and trust in the scientific process. It is so important to our democracy, to our culture, uh, to our human well-being, uh, that the scientific process work well. Uh, it is important that we maintain high, high standards of quality in uh, the communication within science uh, and in the practice and application uh, of science. Um, Scientific evidence in uh, recent years, I think, has been cheapened in the public debate. Uh, and it is all too frequent that public decisions are made in the absence of evidence. Um, we try to keep in mind and to communicate about the broader science and innovation enterprise. Um, in any change in the scientific process, and this includes communication of science and therefore publication, any changes should lead us to ask what happens to the quality. Um, yes, in publishing, we need prompt, and in, in good science, we need prompt, wide access to scientific findings so that uh, others can refine, build on, refute or replace uh, the work. Um, but that statement leaves out the really important part, that we need prompt, wide access to high quality scientific findings. Um, it is um, a, a, a broad enterprise. Uh, we need diversity. Um, we need diversity in science and diversity among scientists. So let me quickly run through a few of those, uh, of, a few of the, uh, of, of the points, our guiding goals that derive from this simple and broad and grand mission. Um, it is our stated purpose to foster communication among scientists and, and engineers and the public, to raise standards of integrity and responsibility in the practice and application of science and engineering, to build a strong future with diverse perspectives, to ensure that science is brought to bear on public issues and is well integrated into the public life, and to see that the foundation is laid with good public understanding of what science is and how it works. And I must say that foundation right now is riddled with holes. It is shaky. The public understanding, and I would extend that to say the policymakers' understanding and appreciation of 
science and the scientific prog process. Um, we try to, let's say, not only look after that base, but oil the mechanism uh, to see that there are good communications and, uh, they are, and that the scientific evidence is brought to bear on public issues for the benefit, as our mission says, of all people. Our communication with scientists and engineers is best understood through Science Magazine and uh, uh, things of that sort that we do. You'll notice I've said quite a bit about AAAS before I've gotten to publishing. We were a membership society for half a century before Thomas Edison brought to us a failing journal called Science and said, see if you can make a success of this. Um, publishing is something that we hold dear. It is important to our mission. It is only part of our mission. The Thomas Edison story, by the way, is worth remembering. Journals can fail without the right business model. So if a journal is important to the scientific enterprise, and we would argue that Science Magazine is a journal that is particularly important to the scientific enterprise, uh, it is important that it have a business model that is sustainable. Um, our publisher, and by the way, you noticed my title was executive publisher, as Kent Anderson or our current publisher, uh, 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 Bill Moran, would probably say, um, uh, I'm the publisher. I've learned that this word executive <laughs> is a word that negates the following word. Um, <laughs> we have a publisher, Bill Moran, um, but I do uh, think about these issues a great deal. Um, with respect to communicating science with the public, uh, we have a program called Eureka Alert, for example, uh, that takes uh, technical findings research advances, whether it's from the science journals or others, and converts them into short pieces that journalists can digest. Uh, it is used, in fact, it's where many journalists start their day to learn about um, advances in science that they can then communicate to the general public. Um, when it is said in, in the open access debates, well, the funders certainly should have access to this research. Um, actually, what they need, speaking as someone who served in Congress for 16 years, is not the research article. I can't think of five members of the House of Representatives that would make good use of the research articles published in Science Magazine. But they do need a public digest uh, of of this research in a way that they can understand it. We have other programs, Sciline, uh, not unlike the media, Science Media Center in the UK that some of you may know about. Uh, it, it's to help writers get the science right in their stories. We give uh, the most coveted science awards, the, the AAAS Kavli Science Journalism Awards every year for large media outlets and small. Um, and um, a number of other uh, things that we can talk about with regard to public communication and training for scientists in communication, the study of the science of science communication and so forth. Um, with respect to setting standards of integrity, uh, we give uh, recognition and awards, the Golden Goose Awards for excellent publicly funded research that was once ridiculed. Um, and this is really a recognition of courageous researchers who, despite the slings and arrows of, of uh, public opinion or political uh, 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 winds, uh, sticks with their research, which is ultimately borne out. Um, we're very interested and very active for decades in science and human rights. Human rights for scientists, but also the application of scientific techniques 
to the monitoring and protection of human rights. Um, diversity has been a cause for us really from the beginning, recognizing the need for diverse aspects, diverse perspectives in the practice of science, but also diverse participation um, in the modern world. Um, I will talk a little bit about our program in budget and policy. Uh, for decades, it has been in the United States the most widely recognized and respected analysis of funding for science. And I will draw on that a little bit with some other remarks. But we also have worldwide programs in science and diplomacy. Uh, I had mentioned the policy fellows that we place in the federal government in all three branches, in the legislative, executive, and judiciary. judiciary. Um, PhD level scientists who spend a year uh, working on policy issues before going back to their uh, professions or, in many cases, making a career change into NGO work or policy-related work. We are, at heart, a membership organization, and our members are scientists. Maybe more than three-quarters would claim to be scientists in some practicing sense currently but also educators, policymakers, librarians, students, and general science supporters. And we never lose sight of that. Um, more programs than I can list or describe. Uh, it's in the many dozens. Uh, in some that I touched on, science and human rights. Some of our members fuss at us for having programs in science and religion, saying that you can't do that. Uh, but in fact, that dialogue is very important in this day's world. Um, and we have conducted a, a very good program there that helps scientists and religious leaders uh, learn how to talk about and think about evolution, for example, uh, and many other such things. Um, I mentioned our awards, awards for women in science, women in chemistry, uh, uh, awards for mentors, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, we run the largest annual gathering for students at the undergraduate and graduate levels uh, coming from underrepresented populations, underrepresented universities and colleges. Uh, it turns out to be really important for them in their lives, suddenly that meeting someone recognizes them as a scientist. Um, and that is enormously powerful. Uh, sea change is something that is uh, related to the Athena Swan program in the UK uh, to reward, recognize and reward institutions that have a good record of self-improvement in uh, diversity issues. Um, I'll touch on the international issues. Uh, we have policy fellowships for scientists and engineers from around the world, um, have courses, as I mentioned, uh, I didn't call them courses, but I uh, will say that we have courses on science and diplomacy held at Trieste uh, at, uh, and uh, South Africa and in the US for where we bring people in. Uh, research competitiveness program helps uh, for example, uh, the cast, uh, case, ca case, cased in, uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia and others around the world develop good peer review programs for their science agencies and academic programs. Um, and we have partnerships with other member societies. There aren't so many, it turns out, around the world. Uh, member general science members societies like our own. I had touched on um, uh, SciLine, which is um, this service for writers to help them get the science right in their story. Another one of our centers for evidence is the new Center for Scientific Evidence in Public Issues. We call it EpiCenter, 
It's kind of cute, don't you think? Um, and um, it is um, to find decisions that are ripe to be made, find the decision makers. So this is not just an ordinary think tank where we do a report with policy recommendations. But rather, we identify decisions that are ripe to be made, find the policy makers, and then uh, develop clever means of communicating with those policy makers in such a way that they can incorporate the scientific evidence into their policy making. Uh, we don't arrogantly presu presume that the, uh, that, that the evidence will speak for itself or that science can make the policy decision. Uh, but it is, I think, a very important way of bringing evidence to bear. This is funded, and I should make the point, I will say a little bit more about this. This is funded by six charitable foundations, Rockefeller and Carnegie and, and some of the others. Um, whereas other programs that I've talked about are funded variously by uh, philanthropic grants, foundation uh, grants, uh, government contracts, um, and publishing revenues. Um, our budget analysis that I referred to earlier and that I'll talk a little bit about now has been funded internally for 40 years. It is a hallmark of AAAS. The emphasis is on U.S. Uh, and U.S. government funding uh, but it has, uh, I think, worldwide significance. Uh, this is funded from internal funds, which come from dues, charitable gifts, and publishing revenue. Yes, we use publishing revenue, Robert John, to do these things. Um, and uh, I will defend that uh, fervently. <laughs> so. Um, just to give you a sense of some of the things we look at, and you might find these interesting, this is a, a look at uh, U.S. research and development as a share of the gross domestic product, percentage share, uh, since 1953 up to almost the present. And it's had its ups and downs, but mostly it has stayed around two and, uh, two and a half percent of GDP. What has changed is that the federal share is much less than half of what it was in the 1960s. And the corporate, the industry share, has grown to more than make up for it. If you look at just federal R&D, so the government portion of what you were just looking at, uh, you see that um, uh, development has been down, research has been fairly steady. Uh, what you don't see very well is the downturn in the last few years. Um, we have had a, um, well, what I think is becoming a crisis of discretionary spending. You know, our budget has what's called obligated, in other words, non-discretionary spending where this would be uh, uh, aid to the poor, uh, retirement benefits for the population, and so forth. Whereas everything else, the running of the federal agencies in transportation and, and education and science research, fall in a discretionary category that has been put on a restricted diet uh, of, uh, of, of shrinking size. And that is... Uh, causing a problem and uh, will cause an, an even bigger problem in the next year or two if, if, that is, if that, those constraints are not lifted. Um, it will cause a, um, a greater problem in the next year or two. Um, the, um, U.S. Um, basic research now that we're looking at, federally funded, industry funded, university funded, and all other, uh, continues to grow in, in uh, constant 2018 dollars since, since the 1950s. In fact, it looks like an astounding growth. Uh, a couple of key points, though, are that the federal contribution 
has shrunk. Uh, the industry has not grown enough to make up for it, but if you look at all funding, um, uh, charitable and so forth, uh, that exceeds the federal government funding. Um, There seems to be a missing point here in the legend. Uh, the top green line is the National Institutes of Health. So around 2000, over a five-year period, there was a doubling uh, from roughly $15 billion to $30 billion for NIH funding. It then tapered off after that, much to the dismay and consternation of the biomedical community. Um, nevertheless, it has remained high, and in the current year has gotten uh, another $2 billion uh, over the previous year. Um, which leads me to a point that you all probably should know, I mean, that I would want you to know, that the much talked about damage that the Trump administration has been doing to science um, <laughs> Is not, really, is not really there when you look at the funding. Um, the, the new administration two years ago came, came into power, came into office with uh, really draconian cuts in science recommended. But the important point to make, and very few people in the US understand this, and I wouldn't expect you to, the White House, the President, does not make a budget. He cannot appropriate a single dollar. It is Congress that does that. Congress repudiated those requests and, in fact, gave science an increase in each of the last two years. Now, this is reduced from where it had been some decades and years ago, but it is growing well above the recommendations of the Trump administration. No, the damage that we see from the Trump administration is in other areas. What I would refer, as I referred to earlier, and what I would call the cheapening of evidence, the uh, disrespect for the scientific method. Uh, we do, we find that missing in a number of the government agencies and we hear nothing about it from the White House. So it's, it's not that the White House and President Trump are antagonistic to science, they are profoundly neglectful. And uh, that's how I would summarize, summarize that situation. Continuing with our part of our budget analysis part at AAAS and relevant to today's discussions, this is total number of articles in all fields. Um, worldwide, well, at least for, for uh, f uh, six major um, uh, uh, countries. And somehow I don't see the UK line here, even though, but it's, it's kind of intermediate there. Um, and, uh, but the US has remained very high, and of course the red line is China. Uh, that's uh, well, we have only one, two, three, four, five, five lines on the graph, but six colors in the legend. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but, oh, is, oh, yes, it is. Oh, it is. Okay. It is there. Okay. It, behind Germany, I see. Oh, that's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, that we, in, in honor of the host country here, we will uh, we'll let that stand. And, um, uh, but the point, the point to make here uh, is that China is coming on gangbusters. And uh, you all know that. Um, many of you are building that into your business, uh, businesses, I'm sure. Um, if you look at research publications, uh, there is the, the division uh, that we find um, in the, uh, um, uh, and this is the U.S. portfolio we're looking at now. 
uh, of uh, the kinds of publications in chemistry, physics, computer science, biological sciences, and so forth. Um, In engineering and physical sciences, China has eclipsed the US and the EU in its output. India is emerging um, in medical and life sciences. Oh, one too many. In medical, that was the engineering. In medical and life sciences, um, it's, a, it's a similar story, but uh, clearly China has not uh, uh, grown uh, to the same extent uh, relative to the EU and the U.S. Um, I will, I, I wanted to say, but I won't take time to go into discussion of international science by looking at students. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, the international students coming to the U.S. are coming in engineering, math and computer sciences, and social sciences, actually more than the physical and life sciences. Um, and uh, for U.S. students going abroad, they tend to go abroad to study science and technology, engineering and math, uh, more than business or the social sciences. Now, Science Magazine, um, as I said, goes back to the, in AAAS's connection with it, goes back to the turn of the 20th century. And uh, every member of AAAS receives Science Magazine. Uh, our member dues, and let me take a moment here to uh, urge you to join. Anyone can join. Um, uh, dues are of order $65. Um, could be more than $100 if you want a print version of Science. And if you're in Europe, there's a, a surcharge for distribution. And for students, it's $25. In other words, for the 700 or so articles published in science every year, the technical research articles, it's um, pennies, well, dimes a day uh, if you want full access on the day of publication for those articles. Um, the membership, of course, is not just a subscription to Science Magazine. There are many aspects to being a member of AAAS, uh, but science, receiving your own copy of Science is certainly one of the well-recognized benefits of membership. We have uh, seven and a half million monthly page views for our publications. Um, and we were a prestige journal, depending on how you define that, long before there was a calculated impact factor. Um, to be published in science, well, as you probably know, the, the article should, have, should represent a significant advance uh, in the science understudy. Uh, there should be novel ideas, important data, or a new synthesis of major lines of inquiry. It should be of broad interest to the science community and, of course, high quality. We add some of that quality through editing, um, review and revision, uh, graphics, and so forth. Uh, reviewers require an analysis of experiments and procedures, a, dis a discussion of what impact the paper might have, uh, in the limited field and more widely. Uh, and uh, the reviewers require pointing to similar presentations. Reviewers are chosen carefully on, an, on, uh, on the basis of a number of factors, but the point is we add value. Um, our access policies, uh, I can go over them with you in detail, but basically we are green open access. Uh, in today's terminology, and uh, uh, be happy to talk more about that. So with about 12 articles a week appearing, uh, that means in any given week there might be one in earth science, one in immunology or physics, and maybe once every two weeks an article in neuroscience or a social science or in genetics. Um, we don't separate out the social sciences 
as Plan S does. Um, uh, and we understand that there are very different research approaches and different research techniques, very different timescales, and very different funding of those researchers. Um, we add a lot through design. Uh, we add a lot through preparing each week lay summaries of articles. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, advise authors to obtain on uh, obtaining multimedia, and we put this out in a way that journalists use it. Um, we communicate with 12,000 reporters about the scientific articles. And in the last year, we've had about 2,300 original articles based on research articles that have appeared in the science family of journals. Um, and um, uh, authors have learned to appreciate this. Uh, we track where these articles appear. This is something Kent Anderson put in place when he was publisher a few years back. So we track The Economist and CNN and the German Zeitungs and uh, Le Monde and New York Times and so forth to see how those are popular versions of our research articles appear. Another value that we add. About a third of our pages are devoted to news, perspective, insights, things other than the research articles. Uh, we have bureaus in Shanghai and Berlin and Amsterdam and Cambridge and Portland and Mexico City. Um, and that's only the half of it. Uh, we, our perspectives run with, uh, to elucidate papers that appear in the issue. About a third of them are standalone perspective articles. Um, we have services in science careers. Uh, we have something called My IDP, which the N NIH now requires for, um, uh, 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 for students on their grants. Um, and we do a lot with digital, um, and I won't go into the fact uh, that uh, our articles are well rated in altmetrics uh, and so forth. So, um, the discussion of open access, I think, really has to take into account the uh, very different kinds of societies that do the publishing, the very different kinds of publishing that they do. Um, and one of the things that we try to do is to see that the discussion is held on the basis of what benefits the science, what advances the science. Uh, it's not based, in our case, on, a, on our business of publishing. Our dedication to the advancement of science precedes and supersedes those business decisions. Our publisher says, no mission, no money, no money, no mission. Uh, we have to be sustainable, but we publish for the benefit of the advancement of science. And that's how we should think about any business model, any mandate of business models, any uh, 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 international uh, uh, requirements on business models. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rush. That was a good, strong finish. We're running slightly late now. Perhaps just a couple of questions. Uh, where are the... Ted Campion, New England Journal of Medicine. Science Magazine is a much respected subscription publication. The speaker who preceded you described a plan that would basically forbid a scientist for publishing in science, or he or she would be sanctioned or, or punished in some way for publishing their research in your science magazine. Do you have any reaction to that? Well, we are actively looking at different models. Robert Yon has 
challenged us to consider changing our model. Um, the, our, our approach is not to change a model for its own sake, but to look at the way that we can best advance science. And um, it's difficult to see how journals like Science Magazine uh, can uh, uh, have a sustained existence uh, under the Plan S model. Uh, and we're looking hard at this. One of our journals, Science Advances, a very a new but very well recognized journal, Kent Anderson helped start that, uh, is um, uh, it's very successful. It's fully gold open access, um, and we're having a good experience with that. But it is not Science Magazine, uh, and I don't see how it could be Science Magazine and everything else that's associated with Science Magazine. Okay. Rush, I have a quick question for you, if I could, back in the back. This is John Courtney. I'm the CEO of the American Society for Nutrition. And I really appreciate the discussion uh, that you've put forth of the value that societies in general, professional societies and scholarly societies, add to the publishing enterprise. I think this is one area that merits a lot more discussion as it relates to the consideration of Plan S that's not being discussed today. So I really appreciate you bringing that forward. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Rush. Thank you.